Welcome to the uh, lecture on developing a research question and an outline. Um, so we're going to just jump in right away. And uh, first of all, I figured that uh, we'd go over uh, where we are in the process of writing the paper so that you get the kind of a feeling for, for what is happening. So uh, we started out by choosing a topic, and we, we, we dealt with this. Then we talked about narrowing down to a thesis, and we talked about that. And then we spent a significant amount of time on gathering um, a bibliography, assessing the quality, the scholarly the nature of the sources, and then annotating the bibliography. And we, you produced the last assignment was the annotated bibliography. So that puts us at the part in red developing a research question, developing an outline, which is what we're doing today, this week, and then we're going to dra first do the first draft, and then the final draft, obviously, that you turn in um, at the end. Now, if you recall, one of the very first uh, uh, lectures that we did, we had this, uh, this uh, image, which I'm sort of uh, reusing now, because, again, it gives you, uh, I think, a good... Um, uh, representation, visual representation of how the process is happening, right? So you start very broadly with a general area of study, which would be your topic, you know, what you're interested in. You do your literature review, you read the stuff, you identify a gap, an opportunity, a problem that you want to uh, work with, then you do your study, and then you do the research questions, and that's where we are, okay? So we are at the tp point of the arrow, that goes down, right? And that's where you want to be. You want to be at the point where you've narrowed it down to something that is very, very focused, okay? And that's really sort of the, the, the thing that I want you to take away from this, that at this point, you need to be focused. If you're not, you need probably to either talk to me or you need to get moving uh, and do your research and, and focus because, because now you need to start working on, you know, uh, you know, deciding what's your research question going to be, and then develop your final thesis for the paper, right? All right, so what's the relationship between research question and thesis? We've been using both of these, um, of these uh, uh, expressions. So obviously, the, the best answer is to say that the, uh, the answer to the research question is the thesis of the paper, right? So you have a research question, and then you answer it, and that's the thesis of the paper that you will be. That will be the first, uh, the first thing that you say uh, in your paper, right? Now, at this point, you might say, why? Are, why are we doing it this way? Why are we going about this this way? We start with a thesis, then we go to a research question, then we go back to a thesis. Well, that's done on purpose. It's not, um, you know, an accident that uh, that the course is is not well organized. It's it's done deliberately. Um, because the only way that you can really have a good research question is after you've read the literature. But you need the thesis to begin to focus your reading of the literature, because otherwise you'd be reading forever and you'd never coalesce to, to a topic. You'd, you'd never go bring it down narrowly enough onto something that you could do, right? So that's why you start with the thesis, you do the reading, you create a research question, and that will then generate your thesis, the final thesis, right? And if you remember, I've already mentioned this in the in a previous lecture, is this whole idea of bootstrapping, right? You're bootstrapping yourself into knowing what to what to write about. All right. So, what are the characteristics of a good research question? Well, obviously, it needs to be clear, right? I mean, I I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to sort of spend a lot of time talking about this because I think it's fairly obvious, right? Um, it needs to be easily understood. However, it, it, it doesn't need to be understood by a 10-year-old, right? I mean, you you uh, you can assume some knowledge of the field, okay? That is, you, you've done the reading, so you can assume some knowledge of the field. It needs to be focused, and that's really important because there it needs to be narrow enough so that you can answer it in one paper. Right, uh, you know, I mean, there's plenty of very interesting questions, and lots of uh, fascinating things to research. But 
you can't do it in a paper. It would take a book, right? And, and we don't have that kind of time. So, so it needs to be narrow enough that you can answer it in one paper, in one paper only. Uh, short, uh, obviously, you know, when I'm, you know, a, a, a research question is not a research paragraph. It's a question, and so it's one sentence, right? And then, you know, obviously, it needs to be interesting, okay? It shouldn't be something for which there already is an answer. It shouldn't be something that you can look up. You know, if I said to you, my research question is going to be, you know, who came up with the idea of the subconscious? Well, you can look that up in a psychology textbook, right? Um, so, so it's not that interesting, right? I, unless you say, well, it wasn't Freud, it was someone else. All right, okay. Then now you've got an interesting thing. But, but if the answer is obvious, if the answer is something that you can look up in any encyclopedia and whatever, then it's no good, okay? Now, <clears throat> All of this is fine and dandy, you probably have no problem with it, but still, practically speaking, how do you do it? So let me give you some examples, uh, and these are all examples from students of mine who've done these as uh, dissertation thesis papers uh, with me recently, okay? So, so, for example, the first one I've already mentioned, I think, that was a dissertation that uh, a student uh, did with me a few years ago, and it was about... <clears throat> the position of the thesis statement in academic writing in paragraphs in English and Chinese, okay? Now, notice how beautifully narrowed down in a... In a you can sort of imagine the, the uh, funnel uh, for this, right? You start with um, position of the thesis in all text. Then you narrow down to academic writing, academic writing paragraphs, academic writing paragraphs in English and Chinese. What about French? I don't care about French. What about German? I don't care about German. Only English and Chinese, right? So it's beautifully narrowed down uh, to a very nice, feasible, uh, answerable uh, question. Uh, this one, uh, also a dissertation. Um, you know, here you need to understand uh, uptake is whether somebody, um, you know, corrects their error in a, um, you know, an oral corrective feedback is if I make a grammatical mistake while, while speaking or a mistake, the teacher is going to correct me, right? And the teacher is going to say, no, that's pronounced this way, right? So then the, tu the student says, oh, and repeats it pronounced properly. That's uptake, right? So then the question that this student asked was, um, you know, people usually like when other people smile. So if the teacher making the correction is smiling, when they make the correction. Does that encourage the student to correct themselves more often? Because they don't always correct themselves, okay? So that was the question. The answer is no, they don't, okay? But, uh, but it was a fascinating uh, question, well worth uh, uh, researching. And the last one is a, a thesis that the student turned in maybe like two days ago, three days ago. Um, do adults control conversations <clears throat> In a dyadic, it means two people. Semi-institutional, it means like uh, on television shows, not at home playing with, uh, with other children. Um, with children, so it's adults and children. And this control, we're only interested in turn length, pauses, gaps, and overlaps. Right? And the answer to that is yes, they do. Okay? They, they, they use their, their superior uh, age and control to, to make sure that the conversations sound as much as possible like real conversation, like normal conversations between adults, okay? Um, okay, so so what do all these examples have in common? Well, first of all, they're clear, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't take a genius to understand what the question is. They're simple. They're straightforward, right? I mean, we're not we're not asking questions that are convoluted. They're very, very focused. Now, remember, you know, like Chinese and, you know, uh, they're empirical questions. That is, you can find an answer. There's an answer to be found. And most importantly, they fill a gap in the literature. That is, there was no, we didn't know before they did the research. The answer was not previously known, right? Okay, so, so that's super important, okay? Now, at this point, 
some of you at least might might feel a certain amount of um, perhaps uh, dissatisfaction or, or or nervousness and say, well, you know, he keeps talking about how it needs to be clear and simple and focused and find a guy. But how do I find uh, this research questions? You know, I mean, is there a book that has research questions? That the answer to that is no. And in fact, um, at the risk of sounding a little bit new agey, um, I would say that uh, research questions come to you. You don't find the research question. The research question finds you. Okay? And now you may say, okay, finally Sal has flipped and, uh, you know, he's, he's totally uh, lost his gourd. Now, and let me, let me give you an example, Okay. And this example that I'm that I'm giving you here is uh, is very recent because I wrote uh, um, a, a, an abstract for a conference that's happening at the end of the month, um, and I turned in the abstract maybe like two or three days ago, or maybe a week ago. So so this is really fresh in my mind. So um, I started from a fact which I was familiar uh, with. Um, which is a, a very common fact that everybody agrees on, uh, which is that around the year 2000, suddenly uh, political satire shows uh, became very popular. And uh, people started basically getting their news instead, from, instead of watching uh, you know, 60 Minutes or, or the, the evening news, by watching these uh, these satire shows, okay? So the, the biggest one was The Daily Show with um, uh, Jon Stewart, but then there was The Colbert Report, and then, you know, and this has continued to this day. I've listed there a few people, Trevor Noah, Bill Maher, Samantha Bee, etc., John Oliver, um, who are, you know, very famous, very popular, you know, and they all do roughly the same kind of thing, which is political satire, political commentary. Even Saturday Night Live, which is a very old show that goes back to the 1980s, okay, has had a revival lately uh, with their political commentary and, and parodies of uh, politicians, um, Sarah Palin, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, Trump, uh, you know, all, all these people, they've, they've made uh, skits and sketches, you know, often with the real person coming uh, onto the show, Sarah Palin was was the the biggest example of of that, right? So so the, suddenly you know so suddenly everybody wants political satire, right? Since about the year two thousand. Well, um, the question that came to me was, well, how do we explain this, right? I mean, obviously it's not that suddenly people got together and said, hey, you know what? Let's let's get more political satire, right? Uh, you know now, and, and and let me add that this is a complex question. This is not something that you would want to do as a research paper for a class like this. Okay, this is the kind of research papers that that you know, professionals do. Now, now um, the point that I'm making here is that I'd been familiar. There's a typo there. I should say since uh, at least 2005. So I'd been familiar with this phenomenon at least since 2005. And how do I know? That it was 2005 because a paper was published on the subject, which I remember reading, and it was published in 2005. So roughly 2005, 2006, maybe I read this paper, and and I must have been familiar with the phenomenon because I don't remember it surprising me. Okay, but it never occurred to me to ask myself the question: How do I explain this surge of political satire shows? Until, you know, as I said, a couple of weeks ago, right? So why did I ask myself the question? Well, because I was reading an article about something else where it talked about fake news and, you know, politicians that openly, you know, lie or contradict themselves on television and so on. And the article pointed out that this is nothing new. We've always had this, or at least we've had it for a long time. And that this trend that started way back in the 1990s in Italy uh, with Berlusconi, who started his political career in 1994, and, you know, this guy, uh, you may not have heard of him, and that's okay, but he was an Italian politician, and, uh, you know, he would say things and then contradict himself and say he never said it, and there was a live recording of him saying it, okay? But he would say, no, the, the newspapers have misinterpreted my words, Okay. 
So I read this article, and again, it's not about political satire, but suddenly I ask myself, wait, the birth of fake news is roughly at the same time as the explosion of political satire, right? And so I ask myself, are the two things connected? And I think they are, right? Now, I cannot explain why, and it's too complicated. If you're, if you're interested, I'll, I'll give you the day that uh, the, the conference is on the 29th. So if you want to attend, it's a, one of those uh, online conferences, so you can attend online if you want. So if you want to know the answer, you know, you'll have to listen to the paper. But my point is this. The question came to me. I wasn't out there saying, oh, let me look for a, a, a thesis to write about uh, the, these comedians. My being immersed in the literature, my reading actively about this stuff, which I do, caused me to suddenly put two things together that I had never put together before, and to the best of my knowledge, no one else had ever put together before, and say, is it possible that there is a connection here, right? So that's what I mean when I say that the question comes to you. You don't actually go out and find uh, the question, okay? But so how do you find the research question? You know, well, first of all, you go, you go out and you read broadly on your topic of, of interest around the focus of your original thesis. So when you're doing so, you will start seeing either connections or gaps, okay? Connection is the example that, that I just gave you. Political satire and political discourse of a certain kind suddenly appear together on the national scene. Is that a coincidence, right? Or, or can we explain it, right? So that's a connection. That's seeing a connection. There's two different things, and you see that somehow they overlap in some way. A gap, we've talked more about gaps. Uh, you know, the example that I have there is also from my from my professional work. Um, you know, so so you know, I, I've read a lot about uh, uh, you know uh, humor and conversation, and most of the literature on humor and conversation is dedicated to how people make it work, how clever they are, how incredibly sophisticated the negotiation is, how how people take into account who their audience is, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to produce successful humor and make sure that the uh, audience enjoys it and laughs. However, everybody acknowledges that sometimes it doesn't work, but nobody had focused on that. And I wrote in a, in a paper, I said, you know, this is a gap in the literature, and some scholars took, took me to my word and, and started doing research and uh, started publishing articles, etc., and now we have, there's even a book on the subject, we have a significant, uh, significantly better understanding of what happens when humor doesn't work as opposed to when humor works, okay? So there was a gap in the literature that we identified and, and filled, okay? Um, you know, so if, you're, if you have to look, that's fine. No, don't panic. There's two places to look. One is find the place where, where several scholars are arguing. Okay, where it's the the center of a, of an argument. Okay, chances are that there is a reason why it is a, uh, an argument. Is that there is a lot of interesting stuff to be done there, and so if you look there, you may you may be able to find something uh, quite interesting. Or on the other hand, in a completely different direction, look at the margins of the debate, at topics that no one seems to be interested in, that nobody is researching. Okay? Because there you're most likely to find gaps like failed humor. Nobody was interested in failed humor until I said, you know, guys, we should be interested in failed humor. Right? Now, there is a risk with this uh, strategy, and the risk is that there is a reason why nobody is going there, which is that it, it might be impossible. Okay? Uh, and this brings to mind a uh, sort of funny anecdote. It's real, uh, but it's funny. When I was uh, teaching uh, comp, uh, you know, as a graduate student, we're talking like um, early 1990s at Purdue University, uh, 
uh, we had our ROTC at, at Purdue, and so one student who was in our ROTC comes to me and says, you know, oh, and I, I and I told the students that they had to write about their their major. So he comes to me and says, you know, can I write a paper about nuclear submarines? So I said, sure, sounds sounds interesting. I don't know anything about the subject. I'll be happy to learn. So so he goes off and comes back a week later and he says, I can't find any resources. I said, well, that that cannot be. You know, you must be looking in the wrong place. So I said, look, go to one of your instructors. I know nothing about the subject. Go to one of your instructors and ask what's, you know, a good journal, a good place to look for, for, you know, sources, scholarly sources about nuclear submarines. So he comes back after a few days and says he went to his superior officer and the officer says, you idiot, it's all classified. (laughs) Because of course it's nuclear submarines, right? So, so clearly the military doesn't particularly want uh, everybody to know how they work and say, "Oh, and here's the position of our nuclear submarine," right? And so the student says, "So I think I need to get another topic." And I'm like, "Ah, yes, you do." So, so okay. So my point is, there might be a reason, right, why no one is doing research on nuclear submarines. Because it's classified, you're not going to find any information, right? Because because all the information out there has been removed, right? So um, so that's the 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 kind of thing, you know, that where you you need to be careful. There might be a reason why nobody seems to be interested in that particular topic, and it might be that it's just a bad a bad topic. <coughs> ah, sorry. All right. So uh, moving on. Um, we have a research question. Um, I move on to the outline, right? So how do we do an outline? Well, this is actually, at this point, it should be old hat. We, we've talked about this uh, before. But because basically an outline is just the organization of your argument, okay? So you're going to have your introduction, which is going to be the thesis statement, uh, you know, plus any introductory materials that you might need to situate your problem, your, your research question, right? Um, and then you're going to have the, the first point, second point, third point, fourth point, etc., are going to be the evidence that you have marshaled to support your thesis, okay? And then the conclusion just repeats the thesis. Uh, you know, we, we've, already, we've already talked about, uh, uh, about this. Um, all right, so... How do you work it out? Well, first of all, start f- by stating your thesis, right? The thesis, remember, is the answer to the research question, okay? So if the research question was uh, the distribution, is the distribution of uh, the thesis statement in um, Chinese and the English uh, paragraph the same, the answer is no, it isn't. Um, you know, the 90-some percent of English paragraphs have the thesis in the first sentence, whereas only 50% of Chinese paragraphs do, okay? So that's a huge difference. That's your thesis, right? So then you would review the literature in a paragraph or two or three or four or five. Uh, you, In other words, you look at the previous work on the subject, and then you say, all right, now how do I prove my thesis, okay? And and by doing this, you, you need to look at yourself, how do you know it's true? What evidence do you have for your thesis, right? So if you have experimental evidence, you will list your experimental evidence. If you, your evidence comes from other people's research, you quote the other people. But basically, you put all the information that you have that shows that your uh, thesis is correct, uh, you, you would put it uh, there. Then another thing that you can do is to say, how would somebody argue against my thesis, and how would I refute those claims, right? So, so you say, no, nah, but, you know, maybe you measured wrong. No, no, my measurements were correct, and here's why, right? So this would be the kind of refutation that we are talking about. Another possibility that also is a valid form of argumentation is analogy, right? So, in other words, are there any phenomena that we know how they work? that I can say, look, my phenomenon, while different, works similarly to this known phenomenon, and therefore it can be taken as an explanation, okay? So, for example, we know 
that English and Spanish apologize differently, right? That apologies in English and Spanish are going to be different, okay? So if my research question was, are Italian and English apologies different, the fact that they are different in English and Spanish is a analogical argument that they are probably different between English and Italian as well, right? Because Italian and Spanish are similar languages. Okay. Um, so, so all the answers to these questions there that uh, that I've listed may be good points to support uh, your your thesis. Okay. Now, use all the evidence that you have. You know, it doesn't have to be empirical evidence. It's still evidence, okay? Um, you know, uh, it, it can be evidence from, from corpus. It can be from frequencies. It can be from the first time that a word has been used. It can be, it depends on what you're trying to prove, right? Um, most of your evidence will come, obviously, from the literature that you've read, and that's perfectly fine. Now, you may say... Am I allowed to use anecdotal evidence? In other words, something happened to me or to somebody that I know or, or I read about in a newspaper, and that anecdote really, really makes a nice point. Well, yes and no is the answer to, to that question. Can you use anecdotal evidence? Yes and no. Um, yes, because, yeah, as we, as we tell you in high school and the... Uh, you know, throughout the throughout the, your years in school, you want to capture the attention of the reader, right? So a good anecdote really will capture the attention of the reader. Uh, there is a book by Schuster called um, uh, I forget what that, Changing Grammar, and uh, he makes an argument that that the way grammar is taught in the schools is not is not good, right? Um, and um, you know. He begins with an anecdote, which is a you know a teacher in a classroom, and she's divided the uh, she's put all the students in the center, and then she's got uh, four labels on the corners of the room, one that says nouns, one that says verbs, one that says adjectives, and one that says adverb. And so then she hands a card to the in each student, and the student is supposed to run to the corner that matches their word, right? So if I give you a noun, you run to the noun corner. So the teacher calls out this little girl, and this is like, you know, elementary school kind of deal, gives her a card, and I don't remember what the word was on the card, but let's say it's three, and the little girl is frozen there in the middle of the room. The teacher gets annoyed and says, come on, come on, you know, go, go, and the little girl starts crying. Because, of course, you know, three could be an adjective, could be a noun, could be a verb. And if you're thinking, no, how's that? Yeah, well, okay, so a noun is, uh, you know, there's a tree in my yard, fine. An adjective is, I built a tree house, right? And a verb is, my dog tree the raccoon, right? So, so tree can be three things, okay? Now, the point of the story is not the, the, the grammar of tree, but the point is that that anecdote makes a very vivid point that grammar is taught by sometimes by people who don't know what they're doing with methods that are just abominable, right? And that anecdote says as much as, you know, a million pages of evidence, okay? Yes, so if you've got an anecdote that good and that's that much on target with what you're saying, by all means, start with an anecdote, Okay. But if the only thing that you've got is, well, when I was young, I was always interested in second language acquisition. That's why I'm writing a paper about uh, error, you know, oral corrective feedback. Please don't. Okay, then it's not a good anecdote enough to, to deserve to be there. Right. So in other words, um, use discretion and check with me uh, if push comes to show about whether to use anecdotal evidence. And remember... Anecdotal evidence is not real evidence. It's just an anecdote. You, you cannot count on anecdotal evidence to make your point. Um, all right, so still <coughs> talking about how to work out uh, the, the outline. Um, in some cases, you luck out. Okay, so if you did an experimental study, although I don't think anybody in this class did, it's, it's fairly rare, 
But if you do an experimental study, you're in luck because it's conventional. An experimental study must be presented according exactly to the structure that I have in the slide. We start with the thesis, literature review, methodology, results, discussion of the results, conclusion. Right? That's the way it is. Don't try to move it around or psychologists will hurt you because they get very uh, uh, pissy about these things. So that's the standard uh, way of working out an outline. Um, remember I mentioned the funnel approach, uh, but let me first say there's other forms of organization, So, but these you shouldn't use uh, because they're not, they're not appropriate for academic writing. So there's the five paragraph essay that was taught in high schools until a few years ago. Um, there's journalism writing, which is completely different, where you basically start by giving the important bit of news and then you stack information increasingly less related towards the end of the story to fill space. Compare and contrast, pros and cons, all of those are fine for uh, you know other forms of writing, not for academic uh, writing. Okay, so that's what I what I wanted to say. So, so going back to the to the funnel approach, remember I said that when you are starting your introductory uh, paragraph, right, the first paragraph of the of the paper, you may want to start from a very broad general statement. Okay, so you might want to start with, you know, cultural differences in language are very important, and different languages organize information differently. Uh, I am going to look at, uh, you know, placement of, of the thesis in the paragraph, right? So you start with a very broad general statement, and then you narrow down increasingly, okay? Um, you know, um, so so the point of the, of the funnel approach is to introduce the thesis using some, some fairly generic general uh, statements, and then the thesis, with the thesis, your essay actually begins, okay? So in a sense... Everything above the thesis in the funnel approach is not really part of the paper, and, and when you summarize it, you wouldn't talk about it. Okay, so so I want that to be clear that uh, it's not that there is a funnel approach to writing an entire paper. The funnel approach is just for the introductory paragraph of uh, where you're going to state your thesis, and if you can state the thesis without doing the funnel, more power to you. Okay, you don't have to have uh, the funnel uh, uh, approach. Okay, um, so is there an outline that's automatically recommended for a research paper? No. Okay, you have to come up with your own. You you, you know, uh, it's not like the the empirical experimental paper where there is a received form, right? You will always start with the thesis. You will always have the literature review second. But then after that, the structure of your argument will come from this. That is, how do you know it's true? What evidence do you have for it? What, what is an argument in favor or against this thing? Are there any similarities, analogies that can help explain uh, this argument? And there might be other forms of evidence that, I'm, that I didn't think about. But because, again, each paper will be organized according to its internal uh, structure of the argument. Okay? So, so you need to think about how do I know that my thesis is true? I, I've found it. I've, I've come to the conclusion that that's what it is. How do I did that? Right? How did I get there? Uh, that's, that's the kind of, of question that... Uh, uh, that and, and when I say how did I get there, I don't mean oh you read the stuff etc. That is how do you get there to the logical conclusion of the point that you're making, right? That is if you said the thesis of my study is that uh, uh, you know there is more freedom of placement of the, the of the thesis statement in Chinese, how do I know that that's true? How did I get there? Well. I analyzed 600 paragraphs and I calculated, all right, okay, so then there was a, an experimental empirical uh, study, right? If you say, well, I have this argument and if it, were, you know, if it were the other way around, then it wouldn't work, right? So therefore, 
that's my argument for for how um, you know the the you know for the for the reason for my reason for stating for stating the thesis right. So it doesn't have to be empirical evidence. It can be logical evidence. It can be evidence that follows from um, you know your readings right. If you say there's at least five scholars that say X, then probably X is true, right? And so that's fine. Uh, that's very good evidence. It doesn't have to be five. It can be four. It can be three. The point is, what evidence do they have? They did the experimental study. They did the empirical work. Or maybe they have arguments uh, that are logical arguments in favor of the point. And so then you will use that. All right. Uh, that ends my uh, lecture on uh, research questions and uh, working out an outline. Um, so thank you for listening, and uh, I will see you next week.